Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Butterfield Alpacas and Fiber Arts podcast. I'm your host, Tasha Butterfield, an alpaca rancher and crochet instructor. I want to start off by apologizing for my voice. As you could probably tell, I have a cold. <laughs> and for parts of this podcast, you're going to hear my nasally voice. So my sincere apologies if it bothers you. Next week, I will be all better and my voice will be back to normal. But uh, in the meantime, I want to give a sincere thank you to all of you who subscribed to my channel this last week. I sincerely was blown away by the number of views and the number of new subscribers, of which there are 40 of you. Amazingly, I really didn't know what to expect when I released my first episode last week. I didn't know what kind of reception there would be. Um, I've been on YouTube for three years, so I have... A good idea about the YouTube analytics and things of that nature and I know enough to know that new channels have a very hard time being discovered so I really didn't know how many people were gonna find me um, but I'm thrilled that as many of you found me as you did so thank you and thank you for returning um, and also a sincere thank you for those of you tuning in for the first time. Um, as you can tell, this podcast is about alpacas and the fiber arts. So a uh, few segments up for today. Of course, I'm going to take you to the ranch and show you what has been going on there. In my studio, what I've been doing this last week. Something special for this episode is just the other day, I attended the Nebraska Llama Association Annual Conference. So I'm going to give you my takeaways from that conference. And then we're going to end the podcast with TV Strings and Things, where I share with you what I've been doing um, with my crochet hooks and knitting needles. So let's get right into the discussion about llamas and alpacas. Let's go on out to the ranch. Hi everyone, welcome to the ranch. So today uh, the weather is about as gloomy as I feel. I think it's about 50 degrees out here, overcast and actually rainy. You're probably hearing the rain on the roof of the barn, which is a tin roof so it amplifies all kinds of sound. So what you're hearing um, sounds like more than what it actually is. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about the differences between llamas and alpacas. Now, a lot of people mistake an alpaca to be a llama. When I take my alpacas to different events, um, parents will tell their kids that it's a llama. Sometimes I correct them, sometimes I don't, depending on the situation. Um, so people easily confuse the two. But when they're standing side by side, you can really tell that there is a difference. First of all, the size. On average, an alpaca is gonna weigh 150 pounds whereas the llama is 350 pounds. So side by side, you really can tell there's quite a difference. Um, also looking at their face, the face shape is different. The llama has a more um, elongated face, whereas the alpaca has a more blunt face. Also their ears are different. The llamas have what's called banana ears because there's a slight curve to those ears even though both come to a point, you know, they're long ears that come to a point, the llama ears are a little different with that curve. The fiber that they produce is going to be different. Now alpacas were domesticated to be fiber animals, like that is their whole purpose. They're, they're not a dual, triple, quad purpose type of animal. They really are for fiber growth. They grow it all over their body and we use it all. We shear the whole thing and we use it all. Whereas the llama, well, it's going to depend on what type of llama you have. There are different categories of llama. They're not called uh, breeds. They're just different categories. Now, four of my five llamas are classics, meaning they don't grow fiber on their legs or on their head. The classic llama, their fiber is uh, pretty coarse especially compared to the alpaca. The alpaca can be very fine. When we go in the studio in a little bit, I'm gonna share more about our grading system for the alpaca, um, grades one through six, and what they mean, and what the microns are. But in general, alpaca fiber is very fine. 
um, especially compared to some other types of fiber animals. And uh, we have a whole whole range of wonderful <laughs> fineness amongst the alpaca. But you also have uh, quite a range with the llama, and actually a greater range where my classics are going to be on the coarser end of things. And they also don't grow fiber as fast, so I don't shear them every year. And um, the only exception is going to be Vinny, because he is, I believe, a light wool llama. Now, there's besides the classic, there's light, medium, and heavy wool. Now, any llama people, if I misspeak, please correct me down in the comments. But <laughs> as I've um, only had llamas for about a year and a half, I'm trying to learn about them, but... Uh, light, medium, and heavy wool has to do with the amount of fiber that the llama is growing. Um, you can look at the legs, how far down the, the fiber growth is, and also on the head. So, uh, Vinny, like I said, I believe he is a light wool, possibly medium, I'm not quite sure. But he should be shorn every year. And shearing a llama is different than alpaca because they just get a barrel cut. They pretty much just get the stuff um, that's going to keep them cooler in warmer temperatures. But they keep the fiber on their neck and chest where in cases where they're used as guard animals, like I use all mine for, when they encounter a predator, uh, that fiber is going to keep them safe. The llamas were bred to be pack animals, depending on which category they fall into. Can be for fiber and guard animals. Now my classics, they're good as guard animals and that's, that's all I need them for. <laughs> Both animals come in a wide range of colors. I did read that alpacas come in more colors. I know that in North America, or in the United States, we officially have 16 colors. Um, I'll get more into that um, in one of the future podcasts in the studio, but just to let you know there are 16 official colors for alpacas, and I don't know about llamas. Um, they come in a variety of colors as well. I just don't know if it's as many colors as the alpaca. Again, if you're a llama person and you know the answer to that question, uh, please comment down below and let me know. One of the things I did this week was I brought a new bale to the girls, which you see behind me. This is an alfalfa and a brome hay mix bale. And I'll insert video here of me uh, bringing it in. I have a bale dolly that I use to move bales around. And it's pretty much just uh, you back the dolly up, you put a spear on the back of it, and use uh, a wench to lift it up. Sometimes it works really well for me, and sometimes it doesn't. This was a time when it didn't, and it fell off twice <laughs> while I was trying to bring it under the lean-to here for the girls. <laughs> This is one of the bales that they really, really love. So alpacas, their main diet is grass. That's it. And uh, they can eat, well, brome, naturally because it's in this bale. So brome, orchard, timothy, um, prairie hay or prairie grasses that grow in my area are fine for them too. And uh, we do limit things like fescue. Fescue should not be um, fed to alpacas because there's a type of mold that grows in fescue. Even if when you originally plant it or you buy seed that is the, the mold free or forget what they call it. I don't even know if it's, they call it mold free in the label, but whatever they call it, um, in time it will start to grow that mold and mold is an absolute no-no for alpacas. So I stick with some of the other grasses that I told you about. I did say that this bale has some alfalfa in it, and that's uh, kind of a special treat for alpacas. I only feed it to them in the winter, and it works out well that the, the bales I have for this year, the alfalfa is mixed with brome because they get to eat both and they don't have too much alfalfa at once. Um, there can be a concern of feeding too much alfalfa because of the protein content. If it's too high, then it actually increases the micron of the fiber that the alpacas are growing. Now, I'm not quite sure at what point is it does that. There is a point where there can be too much, but here when it's mixed with brome and 
up until this week, I've had a bale like this in the barn. I just divvy it out each day and I moderate how much alfalfa they get. They eat alfalfa like it's candy. They fight over it like it's candy. It can be quite humorous sometimes. Um, but now they're all very content because they all get their alfalfa whenever they want. That is going to be it for today at the ranch. As I said before, this last weekend I attended the Nebraska Llama Association's annual conference and it took place in Clay Center, Nebraska, so it was about an hour and a half from my house. And I already knew a number of people that were part of the association, so that was nice. Um, but they had a number of different sections. They had some vendors there. They had a silent auction. Of course, the area where the sessions took place and also tables with activities for children. So uh, you could bring your children there and they could be occupied while you were in the session. Our first session was all about the fiber arts, what we can actually do with our fiber. And the speaker was Kelsey Patton of, I, I have to look this up because I don't always remember, Spindle, Shuttle, and Needle in Stromsburg, Nebraska. And she is someone that you are going to meet in the future because I'm going to have her on this podcast. I'll give you a couple of reasons why in just a moment. Um, but some of the things that she covered in her session were things that I already have talked about on this channel. So uh, llamas and alpacas both being animals that grow fiber that we get to use in the fiber arts. Kelsey taught us um, all about the the washing, the picking, and the carding, and the spinning, and all those things um, that I already have videos and a playlist about. Of course, mine are specific to alpaca fiber, but um, all the steps that I talk about is what she covered. So if you are curious about that, um, I will again link the playlist up in the corner as a card and also down in the description box uh, in case you're wondering. Um, Anything I talk about, any show notes are going to be down in the description box. I don't have them anywhere else. Kelsey is the coordinator for the Mid Plains Fiber Fair, which is going to take place in York, Nebraska, April 22nd and 23rd. So it's not very far away. But what was interesting is that, okay, Kelsey being someone who owns a local yarn store, she would go to fiber fairs in the region um, and she discovered that she would have to drive four to eight hours to get to fiber fairs, whether they be in South Dakota or Iowa or Kansas or Colorado or even far western Nebraska. You had to drive a number of hours to get to any fiber fair. And she realized that there was actually a void right in the middle of our state for a fiber fair. And our state has a lot of fiber artists, let me tell you, a lot of fiber artists. So, Kelsey has coordinated the first annual Mid Plains Fiber Fair. I always have to think about the name. Oh, it doesn't run off my tongue very easily, so I have to think it through. Um, but I'm excited because I love fiber fairs, and they're really awesome ways to get out there and see where you can buy supplies, meet other people who love the fiber arts like you do, and just have fun for the day. Or the weekend, in this case, if you want to be there for two days. So in future podcasts, uh, I will be talking about this fiber fair, because of course I'm going to go. And then after, sometime after that, I'll have Kelsey on the podcast um, in regards to a number of other things that she does. Our second session was about how to run fecals. I forget the actual name of the session, but in my mind, it's running fecals. And that is where you are looking at the poop of your animals llamas and alpacas, um, for parasites, parasites that are compromising their health, that are robbing them of nutrition, and um, that are going to be creating some problems for your animals, and as a result, for you. So to have a healthy herd, you need to be running your fecals on a regular basis. And I already knew this, and I've wanted to get training in this. I even have the equipment. I have a centrifuge and I have a microscope. The microscope you would have seen in my studio tour last week in episode one. So that's why I have a microscope. Um, so I have these different tools to run fecals, but actually how to do them and then how to identify what I see under the microscope, 
those are pieces I did not have yet. So I was very excited that at this conference, they invited a veterinarian to come and explain it to us. And we also got to actually run fecals. There was a llama there where we got a poop sample from him. And there were a number of the younger ones in attendance who got to do all the steps to run the fecals. And I got to look under the microscope. I took a lot of video of this whole process. So I am looking forward to being able to do this part for my own herd. It's really essential that if you have alpacas and llamas that you are running their fecals and you are looking for parasites. Um, if you skip this step, then you are gonna have some health issues in your herd. So I'm very excited that that happened. The third session was about forage utilization. At least that's what the session was called. And it was all about the pastures that we use and the hay that we buy to feed our animals with. And this is also something that I have been looking into and trying to learn more about. Now, although I've had alpacas for five years, I've only had my own property for a year and a half. So with that property came a hay field that was already established. Um, my whole property is 42 acres. 18 of that is the hay field. So I've only had one summer in which I've got to discover what kind of grass it is, how many bales I can get off of it, and now I've went through a winter with those bales to know how many bales I need for the animals that I have, or um, I can project for the ones that I may acquire in the future for next winter. So the things we need to know about forage utilization um, is how to get greater yield out of our hay field if we are growing one, such as myself. So to, what do I need to do to get more grass growing out in that field and a better nutrition grass? And this is one thing I, I found very interesting. The speaker we had, um, he was an educator in the beef industry. So he has been involved in a lot of research having to do with what types of grasses do you feed beef cattle in which they gain the most weight um, and for the beef cattle industry obviously that is pretty important so of course the larger the cattle the more money is made off of that one animal um, so i was listening to all these details and the research that has happened and i found it very fascinating how different grasses affected the cattle in different ways um, and also ones that were irrigated or not irrigated if it was fertilized and all these different elements kind of put together what created the best scenario. So even though he was talking about this research that was for beef cattle, I started thinking, okay, so how can I apply this to my alpacas? Because obviously I'm not interested in them getting fat. In fact, them being overweight is not good. Um, what I'm interested in is are there grasses that make my alpacas grow better fiber maybe more fiber maybe finer fiber you know what would affect what i harvest which is the fiber rather than slaughtering them for their meat um so even though he was talking about beef i was thinking alpaca which other people probably think alpaca or llama and so i went onto one of the facebook groups for the alpaca community and i asked them has there been research done for the best grasses now i know which grasses to feed them like i told you in the segment of at the ranch which ones to feed them but are there ones in which they perform better on that i would get a better yield out of if i fed them that um, and i did get some responses one was a book that i already have but never read so that says the Alpaca Field Manual by C. Norman Evans, and even though this edition that I have is 12 years old, um, there's a lot of information here that I can still learn from, and I was told of some other resources, uh, more recent research, so research papers I can go and read that are right along these lines that would answer the questions for me, because my hay field needs some help. I could talk about that some other time. I won't give you the details, but there are definite improvements that I can make to my hay field. So I need to look into that and make some decisions. And you'll probably hear more about that this summer because that's when I'm gonna have to be making those changes.
as I said before, this conference I felt was excellent, absolutely excellent. The three sessions were very helpful. The people I met were wonderful, wonderful. And now I'm a member of the Nebraska Llama Association. <laughs> move on to our next segment of in the studio and I'll show you what I've been up to over there welcome to the studio today I want to explain a little bit about our grading system for alpaca fiber because it has to do with some of the things that I was doing this week it'll kind of help make more sense as to why I did what I did um, but if you look down here in the corner of my board it breaks down our grading system we pretty much have one to six uh, grade one is the finest fiber that we have. Let's see, the microns are right over here for the grades, if your brain thinks in microns. But um, if you go and buy yarn, that's going to be labeled baby alpaca. And it doesn't mean it's from a baby, but <laughs> it means that it's the finest that there is in terms of grade. Then um, we have grades two and three which are good for any type of knitting, crochet, weaving type thing, stuff that's going to be worn next to the skin. And then we have grades four, well this says four to five, but I would think grade four is good for socks that you still can comfortably wear it next to your skin, but the micron being higher means it can withstand more of the uh, abrasiveness that socks have to deal with. Um, so those are good for that. Heavier pieces, heavier yarn. Um, five, depending on what it is, you can use it for something like socks, but it might also end up in the rug yarn. Number six, you know, when I talk about it, I don't say grade six, I say rug fiber, um, which may or may not be turned into rugs, but it just means that it's something not best for next to the skin, so any type of felting projects it's really good for. Along this wall is all of my rug yarn, or rug fiber. I don't make rug yarn. <laughs> it says rug fiber. So one of the things I did this week was decide what of this fiber is going to become energy mats, because that is one product that I need to reorder. And so what I've done, I'll pan over here, under this table is Mm, just about 30 pounds of fiber, various colors. I got black, white, brown, and fawn up in there. Um, like two different shades of fawn. So about 30 pounds, and that's going to be turned into 50 energy mats. And energy mats are one of my favorite products. They're versatile for like everybody, and they're really good in my area. And um, let me show you what they are. Here are two energy mats that I pulled out. I only have about five of them left in stock. And when it comes to rugs, these are my best sellers. Well, they're called energy mats because they help preserve your body's energy. You basically sit on them, you know, on bleachers or in your vehicle or something. And uh, of course, they add some softness under your tissue. But because of the characteristics of alpaca fiber, it keeps you uh, cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. So, you know, they're great for any kind of sporting events and that type of stuff. And these do well in my area because I'm in an area, well, Husker Nation, where everyone watches Husker games and everyone goes to local uh, sporting events for the high school and stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of people benefit from things like this. Um, but it only takes nine ounces of fiber to make one of these. These are woven, you could kind of see for those of you who are weavers, um, these are woven on a traditional loom as all my rugs are, and they're made um, in Texas. There's actually a video, um, I'll link it down below in the description box about how these are made, which I think are really fascinating. They're not made by machine, they're made on traditional looms, which is why I like to use that company. Um, fiber that I showed you earlier, 50 of these are going to come out of that pile, which is not, that's not much fiber for that much product. So I'm excited about these. This is a, just another type. Whatever colors I send, you know, wherever there's some accents um, or color blocking that, you know, it all depends on what colors I send. I'm back in the kitchen now and I went through these two shelf units 
that they just had bags of fiber kind of stuffed up in them from last year and the year before. So 2016, 2015 shearing days. And I went through and identified the ones that I already knew were rug fiber and those went over on that wall. And the rest, let's see, this shelf here is all Surrey's. And then those two are Wakaya's. I think um, on another podcast, I'll get into the two different breeds and what the difference in their fiber is. But yeah, I have those separated, so those need to be sorted out. And I got through all the bags that were on this unit. So it's pretty empty, as you can tell. And I have to figure out what I want to put there. These bags down here were over there, and they have to do with the current cycle of dryer balls. I'm now over where I have identified the bags that are going to be turned into yarn. And sitting on this table are bags that are the same animal as bags that are already sorted sitting on the seats. Um, so on the table and actually down this bin. So those are Joy, Katzera, Kino, those that I know um, have really nice fiber and I already know what grade they were at least for a year prior. So um, just for sake of time, I'm just going to combine all or a number of years together and send those in. So my project for next week is to actually go through all of these and consolidate by color or by batches that I want run at the mill to be made into yarn and hopefully soon I can get all this stuff to the mill and then I will have yarn. Something else I did yesterday I think you might, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last podcast, but in some past videos, if you've been watching uh, Pack of Tuesday for a while, then you understand this. But I have, or had, rugs, which would be these right here, the at my uh, local flooring store. I had a display, which is this wooden unit here, and um, those are the rugs that were there. And I've had a display there for a few months now. They were there on consignment. And it was kind of a test run. I suspected these types of rugs wouldn't do well in my area. Um, the, you know, the clientele for this type of product doesn't live here, quite honestly. And so I was skeptical how well they would do, but gave it a shot and did sell a few of them. Uh, two or three, um, but it was over a few months period and I... I was like, obviously this isn't working, so I have another plan that I'm going to be doing this summer, and I'll tell you more about that um, as things solidify. I'm not for sure yet about this one thing I'm thinking of, so once I know for sure, I'll let you know about it. But what this means for me now, uh, which I'll probably do tomorrow, is I need to take pictures of these and get them up in the Etsy shop. And these rugs are made in the same place in, in Texas as the energy mats. So those are really fun. I guess finally to tell you for today is, or to show you, is my blocked shawl. If you've been following me on Instagram, you know I finished this shawl. And you saw different uh, phases of it. And I, I'm going to admit, I'm not as comfortable in my finishing techniques in knitting as I am in crochet. I have a lot more experience in crochet. I'm a lot more comfortable in pretty much everything having to do with crochet, but when it comes to knitting, I'm still learning quite a bit. Um, you know, I'm really comfortable with the knit, purl, increasing and decreasing, but when it comes to weaving in my ends or blocking, I'm still learning. So all I've done here is a pretty DIY blocker. This is just like a poly foam piece that I got at my local Hobby Lobby store. This is the type of foam that you would use like on furniture or like in cushions and stuff like that. So when it was on sale and I had a coupon, you know Hobby Lobby always has coupons that you can use. Um, I got this whole, I don't even remember how long it is, but it's this big piece that of course I've just draped over a table and um, I think when I've used it before I actually had a sheet over the foam because I didn't want the smell of the foam transferring to my garments um, when I was uh, blocking things before back when I was machine knitting I was blocking pieces but I had forgotten about that and I had taken the sheet home and so when I 
brought this here to block it and had forgotten about it, I was like, well, I'll just stick it right on here and let's see how it goes. So we'll just see if it ends up smelling like foam. Just, just kind of a, we'll see. But all I've done is spritz it with water. Pinned it down and spritz it with water. And this one specifically, you know, I wanted to block because it had these lacy rows and I wanted to make sure they opened up. Um, if you look on my Instagram, I have a before picture of uh, before the blocking and of me wearing it afterwards. Now let's move on to TB strings and things and show you what I've been up to in my personal knitting and crocheting. Last week I told you, or I showed you, my tapestry crochet fingerless mitts. And I was making that for a class that I was teaching, and the class got canceled. <laughs> Not enough students signed up for it, so the college canceled that. I continued on with my mitts anyway, but there was some wording in the pattern that was confusing me. It was kind of throwing me off a little bit. And I went online and I tried to... Um, find answers to my question, but I was unsuccessful, couldn't find anything. So I started playing around with the pattern a bit. Uh, so I'd work it some, rip it out, work it some, rip it out, try a few things, trying to figure out what this one little phrase wording meant. And I really just ended up getting frustrated and hibernating the project. I was like, I don't have to make them now. So I just put them away. I hibernated them. And then I came to realize uh, from hearing about the Mid Plains Fiber Fair and also the county fair and the state fair of entering projects in for contests. Sometimes you just get a uh, ribbon, sometimes you get a cash prize. But I thought, you know, not a lot of people are going to be doing tapestry crochet projects. So maybe I should just do this project to submit into one of these contests. So I think that's what I'm going to, going to do. I had planned on hibernating it for longer than this, but um, I'm going to bring it out of hibernation a little sooner than I originally expected. As I told you last week, I'm always doing one crochet project and one knitting project. So since I hibernated those mitts, I had to do something else. I chose to bring something else out of hibernation. It's something that I've been working on actually for a couple of years off and on. I'm sure I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> it is called the Circle Vest by Lion Brand Vanna's Choice. So Vanna is in Vanna White of Wheel of Fortune. I don't know if you knew that. She has her own line of yarn and um, crochet hooks and things. So that is the picture of the project. Again, it's in black and white. You could probably tell different shades of gray on there that this is supposed to be different colors. But I chose to just make it all one color. I didn't want that multicolored look, at least in this case. And the yarn that I choose to, chose to use, I actually got in Korea. Yes. Now, I don't think I've told you this before, um, I did teach English in Seoul, Korea for six months back in 2011 into 2012, and that was right around the time that I got into alpacas. Like, I bought my first alpaca joy two weeks before I left the country. Yes. So if you want to hear more about that story, um, I'll link it down in the description box below. Um, it's the same video I told you about last week if you want to go see it. Of course, while I was there, I was looking for yarn stores and yarny people to to get together with and work on projects which i found both now this yarn i got um i don't even know what it's called there is about seven levels of different all kinds of stuff from furniture to household items um, one floor was all crafts so you had um threads you know, like for sewing, you had beads for jewelry making, and of course you had oodles and oodles of yarn. And this is one of those places, kind of like a swap meet kind of thing, where there's multiple vendors, like smaller spaces of multiple vendors all together. So you'd walk these floors and just be vendor after vendor after vendor, and they're permanent stores. They're always there. And so I don't know how many stores there were for yarn. Um, the thing about Korea is they don't 
I don't think they make yarn themselves. I wasn't aware that they made it. So a lot of the yarn that's available there comes from Japan or China because they're both they're neighbors of both countries. Um, if you're familiar with the Noro yarns, those come from Japan. Japan also has amazing knitting patterns. Some of you may have gotten into the Japanese stuff. Um, a lot of the knitting machines over the eras and even now come from Japan. Um, so when it comes to the fiber arts, you know, Japan is an awesome, awesome country. Uh, but a lot of the yarns available in Korea also come from China. And I believe that's where this came from. So let me show you the label. Yes, it says wool. So I know it's made of wool. I don't know if there's other things blended in with it. Um, and there it is in Korean. I cannot tell you what this actually says. I'm assuming it says yarn. <laughs> and then there is some print there. See, it says made in China. Yes. So there is English there to show you how to wash it and stuff, but I don't know what this means. I really don't. Um, or this, 95 grams. I don't know what the plus minus five means. I don't really know. If anyone knows, you could tell me in the comments, please. Um, no color or lot number. <laughs> and then um, these symbols that are pretty universal now. Kind of help me make my choice. Um, but I really wanted to buy yarn in Korea. And I bought the whole package. There's, I guess, a lot. You know, 10 or 12 skeins of yarn and um, I bought more too. One day I'll show you those other ones as well. But this, I finally decided I was going to make uh, or use to make this vest because I was going to need a lot of yarn. Um, this is a, more of a bulky weight, even though this pattern says more of a worsted weight. So it's heavier than I should use for the pattern, but I think it's coming out fine, and especially once I wash it, I think it will be even better. So let me show you. There's that center medallion thing, and then as you can tell, I've done it all in the same color. Um, armhole, armhole. It's just a massive circle, and I have about seven rounds or so left to finish it, and we'll see at seven rounds when I finish the pattern. If I want to add more or not, well, we'll just see. Last week I told you I was going to pull out some more of my knitting things that I've made over my seven years of being a knitter. Um, and I also told you I do a lot more crocheting than knitting. I feel like I'm really still learning a lot about knitting. Um, what I'm wearing here is an arm knit scarf. I think it's only four stitches across arm knit and guess what I did it for a class <laughs> I taught a class on how to arm knit um, and that was early on in my crochet teaching career here in Nebraska um, so a store that's near me like it's a variety type store and they do carry yarn and tools for crocheters and knitters and that type of thing so they had this sachet yarn do you remember when that was really big uh, Red Heart Boutique Sachet. I don't have the label anymore, so I can't show you. Um, but some of you remember, it's it made that the ruffly scarves. And I never liked the ruffle looking scarf. I just, it never appealed to me. Um, but this store in this little town near me had a lot of these in stock. And I wanted to help them sell through it. So uh, if you look at the label of sachet, it actually calls it a bulky yarn. So I taught this class on arm knitting as a way to use up the sachet yarn um, as a bulky yarn. So I did a couple experiments. This was the first one I did in all gray. And I did six stitches across. Um, and then I made this one, which was just four stitches across, and I think it turned out better. And this is one of my favorite scarves. It's so fun to wear, and it's so easy to make. I just went on YouTube and watched one or two videos on arm knitting, and voila! I mean, it was it's super easy to do. So if you have bulky yarn in your stash, or even this sachet stuff, um, let me show you if you aren't familiar there. So you knit or crochet down one side and the rest comes 
open like this and it's this frilly ruffly looking scarf um but like i said we used it just all together as a bulky weight yarn which is exactly what it says on the label all right so enough about that oh wait i have another one i thought i had another one i actually wore this yesterday so this is in another um color of the sachet which i thought was really pretty it has these little sparkly deals in it too um so yeah i wore this yesterday it's really I think it's a great way to use this type of yarn. Uh, let's see. You know what? I showed you last week my uh, knitting project that I w was in the process of making, and I finished it. If you're on Instagram, if you follow me on Instagram, you saw the completed version or pictures of this. So, yeah. Mm hmm. It's pretty. I think it's pretty. Uh, let's see. This is something else I had in my, in my closet. This, again, was a skill builder project. It was my first shawlette and my first attempt at lace work. This is not blocked yet. I realized when I pulled it out of my closet, I had never blocked it. And I need to take it down to the studio and do just that. But like I said, this is my first attempt at lace work. So it has all these leaves across here and it's a shawlette, so it's not very wide. Um, yeah, yeah, I I liked how this came out too. All right, I'm getting hot, so I need to take this stuff off. Let me show you something special. My very first knit socks. I took a class on how to knit socks. The place where I taught crochet classes in Chicago, the local yarn store, they had a sock class. And um, this is a DK weight wool with nylon in it. And, you know, my first attempt, I still have the pattern for this. So I think, I think this one was the one I did during the class. And then sometime later, like a few months later, I made this second one to go with it so my gauge was different and look they're not the same size <laughs> they're not the same size but I wear them in the winter all the time when I go to the ranch they're wool so they keep my toes very warm and cozy and so I just wear these in my boots to the ranch I really don't wear them any other time they don't have to look pretty. They don't have to be exactly the same size. When I'm wearing them, I don't notice that they're different sizes. What I notice is that my feet are comfortable. So with that in mind, when I got that DK weight in my of alpaca yarn in my store, I decided I was going to make alpaca socks because it's 30% um, wool in this yarn. That would be great for socks, especially ones that I wear just like those. Uh, only to the ranch. So this is the progress of that uh, using the same pattern as from the class and I forget why these were hibernating for a while and I forget exactly why. Um, so I learned uh, to make socks on DPNs. I've never tried magic loop or two at a time. I do have a book on making two at a time socks. I have not attempted that, but it was in the plans. I loved making socks and I really love the idea of making more socks. So yeah, I have uh, plans to complete the alpaca sock and of course make its pair. But last year when I was in Chicago, I went on a sock buying frenzy. At least for me, it's a frenzy. I'm never one to buy a lot of yarn. And when I do, I have something in mind for it. I'm not one who buys yarn just to buy yarn. And I think it's because I was a crocheter first. So for a lot of crochet projects, you need more than one skein. And a crochet takes more yarn, so it takes more planning <laughs> of yarn for a project. So I never really got into just buying yarn to buy yarn and figuring out later. Because I always thought, well, I'll just not have enough for a, a crochet project. But now that I knit, I can buy one skein and it can be enough for lots of different things. So let me show you the sock yarn that I bought last year. 
first up we have this beautiful skein um, which I'm gonna have to learn how to match the fading of color the changing of color that's something to learn if you have a resource for me on that please tell me down in the in the comments but this is the Rowan fine art hand painted sock yarn it is merino wool kid mohair polyamide and mulberry silk yes yes so I'm looking forward to making that this one some German brand of jean style color so a bunch of blues oh wait here's their sample all knit up there it is there's the focus okay and so for this one I believe it's a super wash the the first one I showed you is not I think this one is yeah dryer proof and all that so again um, a fingering weight and then finally I have one from Malabrigo this color Arbol so browns greens you know very neutral again um, two of my favorite colors are green and purple so you're gonna see a lot of uh, things along those lines in terms of my yarn so these are actually all fingering weight sock yarn weight right so uh, that's gonna be new for me as well I've only used size 5 DPNs to make socks because it's a DK weight. Um, and now I'm going to have to go down um, smaller needle size. I did get the Chowgo, the 9 inch circulars. This is a size 3. So, you know, all this is a whole new world for me, the whole sock thing. But like I said before, I love the idea of socks. So not from last year, but I have crocheted socks before. This would have been after I took my sock, the knitting socks class. Um, I tried crocheting socks. And this is in the fingering weight. And it's uh, three Irish girls. I love all the colorways of three Irish girls. I think they are amazing. So this one is in the colorway Rainin. Um, love the greens you know they're very comfortable it's a great yarn and this pattern um, I'll link it down in the description box but it actually came from a publication of the Crochet Guild of America now I, I bought that one at the same time that I bought this one um, let me see the colorway for this is Liam oh isn't that nice show you a close-up of this one and this one I meant to you know make into socks like the other one um, but I've used it as a sample in my crochet classes when I'm talking about different weights of yarn and it also gives them a chance to feel some wool um, which beginning crocheters of course like being beginning knitters don't know much about uh, fiber content of yarn so kind of a little intro to that so this week I plan on completing that circle vest and I really hope I have a completed project to show you next week um, and that I would be working back on my tapestry crochet mitts. That would be really awesome. And then of course for knitting with the socks, I kind of foresee doing some crochet projects, the, the vest and the, the mitts, continuing on with those before I get back into my knit socks. But I do want to finish those soon and move on to all of my knitting sock adventures. Yes, so that's going to be it for today's podcast. If you like it, please give it a thumbs up if you like what today's podcast was about. Um, if you know other of others who would enjoy this podcast too, please share the video with them. If you have ideas for any topics you want me to address in future podcasts, please leave me a comment down below. I will see you next week on episode three.